the same page. So, in the last chapter, we learned how Clausius had or discovered this state function entropy and more importantly, the equation that you can use for calculating entropy for any process to find the, the, equal, the entropy difference for any two equilibrium states. And Boltzmann, just a few years later, was trying to find out from a microscopic point of view, what was the understanding? How, did that, how, did, how do we think about entropy from a microscopic point of view? And so again, you knew that you know, a system will evolve, an isolated system will evolve under time, you know, during time, to a state of equilibrium. And in that state, the entropy will always be increasing until it reaches equilibrium. And then the entropy will be at a maximum. Right? So then at that point, the change in the entropy will be zero. So we know that the entropy evolves increasing until you reach a maximum at equilibrium. He knew that. He also knew that entropy was related to probabilities. Because we knew, for example, in chapter 3, when we were looking at Maxwell's distribution of speeds, that this distribution of speeds was what you had at equilibrium. But if you started out with whatever distribution you can imagine, as I said, uh, you know, whether all the energy was in one particle or all the particles had exactly the same velocity, whatever non-equilibrium distribution you started with, over time, with collisions, it always evolved into the Maxwell distribution of speeds. So, we know with time, the entropy always increases until it reaches a maximum. And so this distribution seemed to be related to whatever that entropy maximum would be. So whatever you started with, it always evolved into this shape where the entropy was a maximum. So it seemed to be related to this probability distribution. The probability distribution was changing until it reaches the equilibrium probability distribution where entropy is maximum. So that was one thing that he knew. He also knew that when you expand a gas into a vacuum, that there's no work done, and the change in energy obviously is going to be zero. This is adiabatic surroundings here, so it's uh, boundaries here. So the change in uh, energy is going to be zero. And for an ideal gas, we know that that means the change in temperature would be equal to zero. So if the change in temperature was zero, that means that when this gas expanded, if it was 300 Kelvin before, it's 300 Kelvin after, and the distribution of speeds was exactly the same. So even though the entropy increased, because we know the entropy increases over here, the distribution of velocities hadn't changed. So obviously, the entropy is also a function of the probability distribution of positions of the molecules, not just the velocities of the molecules. Okay? That makes sense, right? So we know that entropy has to be related to the microscopic states that are there, but it's going to be related to the probability distribution of positions and velocities. Okay. Now, I told you last time, and we'll go back through this again, Boltzmann introduced these two concepts called the, the macrostate and the microstate. And the macrostate is that thermodynamic system in equilibrium, which has its you know, you know, n parameters, you know, it, these, those n independent parameters from which we can derive all the other dependent thermodynamic equilibrium uh, state functions. And the microstate was, I sort of gave you the analogy, as kind of like a spreadsheet with 10 to the 23rd you know, uh, rows, and each, you know, there'll be columns for x, y, z, p, x, p, y, and p, z, and you'd have this massive spreadsheet, and that would be like a snapshot of the gas and we would just tabulate all those positions and momenta, and that would be what's called a microstate. And there will be many microstates that correspond to a given macrostate. The macrostate's only characterized by just a few, a handful of thermodynamic uh, state functions, whereas the microstate's got 10 to the 23rd parameters for all those positions and, and momenta, right? So you can imagine stacks of spreadsheets. All of these spreadsheets are microstates that are consistent with the macrostate. Okay? So what Boltzmann was thinking was that a system as it evolves, it goes from to greater and greater entropy, is evolving to states where the to macrostates which have a larger number of microstates that are consistent with it. Does that make sense? So when you think about that gas expanding. The, the original gas before it expanded had maybe had, I don't know, 
10 to the 23rd microstates, but then as it expanded, it might have went to 10 to the 24th and 10 to the 25th microstates as it expanded to describe the gas in the, both volumes, right? Okay, so what he said was then that there is this entropy function for a given macrostate, which depends upon the number of microstates that maps to that macrostate. That's the basic picture, right? Now, we can actually get the functional form for this function from very simple arguments. We know that the, if we have two systems, to say system A and system B, and they're isolated systems, and I take system A and system B and I combine them to a super system, say, but I keep them isolated, then I know that the total entropy of the com combined isolated systems is just going to be SA plus SB to give you the total entropy, right? And what, if this entropy is a function of the number of microstates, number of microstates of A uh, and the number of microstates of B, so we would have S total is equal to S as a function of, of omega A plus S as a function of omega B, that is what we need to have be true in order for this entropy to be an extensive property, right? It's linear and proportional to the amount of material. It's also true that if these are two isolated systems, then the number of microstates in each of them is independent of each other. They're not interacting with each other. So that means that the total number of microstates for the, the collection of the two systems has to be simply the product of the number of microstates for A times the number of microstates for B. Okay? So that means that our equation up here needs to be in this form where S is a function of the product of the number of microstates, is, which is equal to the S of the microstates A plus S of microstates B. That's what's called a functional equation, and we just need to find a function that will satisfy this, and you can see very simply that that would be satisfied by a function which is just the log of the number of microstates. So with a proportionality constant that gives us the right units for entropy, Boltzmann could propose that the entropy is just some constant times the log of the number of microstates. And that function will satisfy what we need up here. So that means that for any change between two equilibrium states, from Boltzmann's expression, we can calculate the entropy change as just the entropy. The final entropy minus the initial entropy, which with the property of logs is just Kb times the log of the ratio of the number of microstates final over initial. Right. So that's a pretty simple definition, derivation of how, how that works, but it's actually impressively powerful what we can learn from that simple picture. So we go back to this example of the gas expanding into a vacuum. We know that's a spontaneous process. We know the entropy over here is lower than the entropy over here. The number of microstates describing this is smaller than the number of microstates describing over here on the right. So from a macroscopic point of view, there's only you know, three parameters, naturally chosen, say, to be E, V, and N. So what we need is the number of microstates, which is a function of E, V, and N. In this case, V is changing. And we know that it's going to be microstates counting is going to require us to know about momentum and position, right? We know it's a probability, the probability entropy is a, depends on the probability of the momentum distribution and the position distribution. So we know that the total uh, number of microstates is going to be related to both of those uh, uh, quantities, in other words, for each one of the individual particles in here. And because in an ideal gas, we know that the translational energy and the positions are actually independent of each other. So we know that the energy of an ideal gas is independent of the position. It only depends on the kinetic energy of the particles. The kinetic energy only depends on momentum. So that means be, because in an ideal gas that it's only dependent upon, uh, the energy is only dependent on kinetic energy, only on the momentum, we can separate the microstate counting into a product of the number of microstates associated with the momentum and the number of microstates associated with the positions. All right? So that's just a trick that we can do for ideal gases, but if it's a real gas, then we know that the energy is going to be a function of the position because there's potential energy of interaction between our molecules, so there's some potential energy surface, and we know that as the molecules move, that their energy is going to change as a function of position. But in an ideal gas, the gas particles don't see each other, and there's no interactions between them. 
So that allows us to make this simple uh, multiplication to give us the total number of microstates. So the way we're going to count the microstates then is we're just going to focus on the positions here because we know that as that gas expands, the, the gas expands that the momentum distribution is identical. It's only the position distribution that's changed. So that means the number of microstates for the momentum from between here and here has stayed exactly the same for an ideal gas. But what's changed is the number of microstates associated with position. So if we're going to count position microstates, then how do we do this? Well, very simply, we can do it by just taking the, the volume that holds the sample and just discretizing it up, chopping it up into little tiny volumes. You know, in, in 2D, I would say it's like pixels on your screen, but in 3D, it's like voxels, right? These are just tiny voxel volumes. We'll make this as small as possible. We'll make it small enough so that the voxel is so small that any one voxel at any particular time is either empty or occupied at most by one molecule. Okay, that's how small we're going to make them. Now, the number of ways in which one molecule can go into the box is just the number of voxels divided by, uh, just the number of voxels, right, which is just the total volume divided by the size of the voxel. So the number of ways that we put two molecules in it, you would think would just be the number of voxels squared. But it turns out that it's actually the number of voxels squared divided by two factorial. And classically, you wouldn't put this two factorial in it, but in quantum mechanics, we're going to learn that particles are indistinguishable. So when they're moving around in some volume, we can't actually identify particle A and particle B as actually when they come close to each other and they, they, they separate from each other, we can't actually say, well, A went this way and B went this way. Once they collide, then we can't figure out which one was which after the collision. So that's what's called, the, comes as a result of the, the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. And because of that, we have to look at all of the, the microstates and any states that involve these permutations that are indistinguishable, we have to count them only once. But that's the, the tricky part here, and that's just a result of quantum mechanics. So that means that we're going to have to divide by two factorial with two molecules, but if we have n molecules, we're going to have to divide by n factorial in order to avoid counting these configurations that are absolutely identical in quantum mechanics. So that little, that little side story there is important to get the answer right, particularly for the, for the entropy, but that actually is needed then to finish our counting. Otherwise, it's as simple as V over, uh, you know, capital V over small v to the nth power divided by n factorial. So that is the number of microstates in that volume that we've discretized down to these little voxels of volume V. Okay? And so it's just V, capital V over little v to the n power divided by 1 over n factorial to account for this indistinguishability of particles. So then if we go back and we say, okay, I want to get this entropy change for that process, this process here, then I'm just going to take the ratio of the number of microstates for, for V final over V initial, and when I plug in that total expression, remember it, it is also includes the momentum and position in that product, but when I put them in this ratio, well, the momentum number of microstates is absolutely identical because this is an ideal gas, so that's going to cancel out, and all we're going to have left is the ratio of the position number of microstates, and that's this expression up here, which just simply gives you V final over V initial to the nth power. Okay? Well, that's it. That's our ratio. Then we can plug it into the, the uh, entropy change equation, and that gives us this expression here using the property of logs. We can bring that n down. We just get k, n kb log of v final over v initial. If I turn that into the number of moles times Avogadro's constant times the Boltzmann constant, I get this. This is derived completely from Boltzmann's equation by discretizing space. We get the entropy change. And in thermodynamics, we got the entropy change knowing the equation of state. And we were able to get this expression here. And you can see they match once you make the identity that the Boltzmann constant is just the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. Okay? That's pretty cool, actually. Just from counting, you get this. 
Any questions on that? Yeah. So do we not have for me the equation for the momentum microstates? In this yes. particular problem for the ideal gas, you do not need okay. the momentum, count the number of the momentum states. Yes. Other problems, if you're going to calculate energy, then it's going to be involved there. But for this, you didn't need it. Yeah. This is just, just to show you how, the, in the simplest possible example, it come up with how you can calculate an entropy difference. It's going to get more complicated as we try to bring in more of the factors. Other questions? Yes? If they break the end, Oh, how did I do this step here? Yeah. Okay, so the question is how did I go? I went from uh, n, which is n is the number of particles, and times kb, right? And I said n is the number of particles, which is also the number of moles times Avogadro's number, right? So I just replaced capital N with this lowercase n, which is the number of moles, times the Avogadro's number. Yeah, so maybe I should have specified that lowercase n is the number of moles, yeah, from the last chapter. There's so many ends in this, and I've tried my best to change the font for all the ends so that they're all different, so this particular end is just the number of moles. <laughs> okay, so now, this is sort of where we were at the end of the last class. Uh, let's take a look again at how we can use this uh, picture to get the ideal gas equation of state. So uh, a little hint is we're going to use that if n gets really large, you can use something called Stirling's approximation for factorials, which means it equals to this. If n gets you know, 10 to the 23rd n, you're perfectly fine to use that for your approximation for uh, the n factorial. So if we go back to our expression for the total number of microstates, which is the product of momentum times position for the ideal gas, then we can plug in this expression up here. And you can see that if I take this expression here and it's full, you know, the full expression here, not taking the ratio, then I plug that into the entropy expression of Boltzmann, then this all goes in here. And using the rule for, for logs, I can take this, all these products and I can split them up. Okay, so I'm going to let you work that out on your own, but it's just substituting this into there and then using the log rules to split this up. But now, what I'm going to do is go back to thermodynamics, and if you remember, in the chapter on thermodynamics, we saw that there were these, these thermodynamic potentials, and we could look at those thermodynamic potentials and figure out how those partial derivatives related to other thermodynamic quantities. So we saw in that chapter that the partial of entry with respect to volume at constant E and N was equal to the ratio of pressure over temperature from thermodynamics. So if I have an expression for entropy as a function of volume, which is here, if I take the partial derivative of that with respect to volume, then this, all of this goes away, that goes away, we just have this term here, and I end up with nkbt over v, which this just becomes nr over v, and that's equal to pt, and you see what we end up back with this, from this is pv equals nrt. So we just derived the ideal gas equation of state from this, this expression here, without it actually even knowing what the kind of being able to count the momentum, uh, the number of microstates there, just from the configuration part, the, the position part. Okay. Does that make sense, how we've gone through this? Okay. So I've, I've cherry-picked the simplest case, right? I've taken just the ideal gas where we can separate momentum and position microstates, but just to illustrate how this works. Any questions? Now obviously, if we have a, a gas that's real, and we were not going to be able to do this separation with momentum and position, and we need a more general approach to count microstates. And this is where it conceptually can get a little tricky, but it's all pretty much the same idea. So let's see what we have to do next. Well, what we're going to do is to count microstates in this more general case, we need to move into something called phase space. And we talked about this. This is actually at the very end of chapter one. I put it at the end of chapter one. And if you remember, there are these ways in which we could get the equations of motion 
from you know the New Newton's equations of motions we could get by just having a kinetic energy and a potential energy function. Right? We use the kinetic energy function, the potential energy function, we take all these partial derivatives and we plug them into the Lagrangian form and we could get it, uh, all these couple differential equations. Well, well, a little later, actually, Hamilton reformulated it, just pretty much the same thing, but you have all of these momentum and position coordinates. You can create a function called the Hamiltonian function, and it's just equal to a kinetic energy function plus a potential energy function, okay? So again, we talked about all of this in chapter one and how you could sort of stop with all those force uh, vectors and you could just work with, with uh, potential energy and kinetic energy functions. But now you have a, uh, a, a total function which is called the Hamiltonian function, it's kind of the total energy function essentially, and from that function you can get all of these coupled differential equations and then you can solve for the equations of motion. All right, now, if I have 10 to the 23rd particles in a box, then I have 10 to the 23rd x coordinates, y coordinates, z coordinates, 10 to the 23rd px, 10 to the 23rd py, and pz, right? So I have a lot of coordinates there, okay? If I take just the position coordinates, I'm going to create a n-dimensional space. So if I have, you know, for molecule one, x1, x2, x, x1, y1, z1, and then for molecule, for molecule, sorry, molecule one, x1, y1, z1, for molecule two, x2, y2, z2, I'm going to create a space for, for this dimension for every single one of those coordinates. So x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, and imagine doing that for all 10 to the 23rd. So you're, I'm asking you to imagine, close your eyes and imagine a 10 to, 10 to the 23 times 10 to the 23rd dimensional space called configuration space. Okay? At the same time, we also have to worry about momentum. So I want you to imagine then that we have a 3 times 10 to the 23rd dimensional space for momentum and then combined together, they form a 2n dimensional hyperspace called phase space. So phase space has a, you know, for, for the position coordinates, which are, I'm calling q, and the momentum coordinates are calling p, so it's q1, q2, q3, q4, q5, p1, p2, these are all dimensions in this space, okay? I know it's hard to even think in 3D, 4D becomes really hard. I'm asking you to think in three to two times the number of particles into the 23rd dimensional space here. So, so this is what's called phase space. But what's important is that the state of the system at any instant in time, which is that spreadsheet, is a single coordinate in that space, right? So even though this space is massive in terms of this dimensionality, one point in that space describes the state of the system. That is that spreadsheet, right? That spreadsheet says that point. The next spreadsheet says that point. The next spreadsheet says that point, okay? And as that system evolves in time, it's a point moving in this phase space, okay? We need this phase space in order to count microstates. So try to get this sort of, as best you can, clear in your head. But the system will evolve in this phase space, and we're interested in that. Now, if the Hamiltonian is constant in time, which means that it's a conservative system, then that point will evolve in phase space on a, a hypersurface that corresponds to the constant energy surface. So in this hyperspace, this phase space, there is a, a hypersurface which is associated with the constant energy and the system moves around on that hypersurface. You got that? All right. So to count microstates, here's what Boltzmann did. He discretized phase space. So we discretized volume. We made the little voxels, right? The voxels are little three-dimensional voxels, right? 
Now we're going to discretize phase space, which is you know, 10 to the 23rd dimensional, right? Phase space. Okay, we, we have to do that because that's how we're going to count, just like we had to count in the first case. So we're going to treat then, you know, that all the position and momentum are going to be discretized and that we have this sort of hypervoxel that for, for, for pairs, because I'd say pair of Q and, and the corresponding P, they're going to be equal to some number which actually has the units of angular momentum. Uh, but that's going to be the sort of the voxel size just for each pair, and you're going to do that for all the different, the total voxel volume is going to be this. Uh, my hypervoxel volume is going to be this. But what we're going to pick is one constant, so all the voxels, you know, we're going to pick the same size, and so we're not going to make different lengths for, you know, on each of the, each of the, the voxel size. We're just going to pick them all with all, you know, a hypercube of identical length on each side. What Boltzmann didn't know about, and Boltzmann was really way ahead of his time, he didn't know about quantum mechanics. He actually didn't know that the actual nature of phase space is discrete because of quantum mechanics. He just, he was just looking for a way to count. But it turned out, actually, he was right about phase space being discrete. Uh, so, but he didn't know about the quantum uncertainty principle that there is actually a lower limit. So in other words, we live in a world where space really is discretized. We all we do live in a voxelated world, right? Universe. That's the lower limit, right? That was proposed by in 1927 by Heisenberg, right? So we're just going to go ahead and do what Boltzmann didn't know, which Boltzmann was saying, well, in the limit that I make h smaller and smaller, I should get the right answer, right? Well, Boltzmann didn't realize that you, you reach a bottom where you can't go any lower than that. So we're just going to go ahead and set that equal to Planck's constant. And that's going to be our hyper discretized voxel, right? Okay. This is how we're going to count microstates. So the Hamiltonian is time independent. So our system, which is a point in this space, will only be moving on this some surface of constant energy. And we just need to count the voxels, the hypervoxels that are on that surface. All right. I would make more pictures, but I don't know how to draw them. But I'm going to try. So let's start with the simplest picture of phase space, a particle moving in one dimension. All right? If we have a particle, a single particle, moving in one dimension, well, OK, we only have q1 and p1. All right? So that's actually two-dimensional space I can think in two dimensions. Right? And we can say that Hamiltonian is this, where it's got some kinetic energy term and a potential energy term yet to be specified. But we're going to specify it so that it's simply zero if it's inside the box and infinite outside the box. So that enforces the fact that the particle's stuck inside this box. Okay? And now we know that with inside the box that the, the momentum can only be plus or minus the square root of 2 and again, just rearrange this expression here to solve for the momentum at any given point. Now, the phase space is two-dimensional in this very simple case here. And so I've gone ahead and discretized it and expanded it so you can see the discretization here. And I've marked then all of the states, all the microstates that are associated, that are consistent with our Hamiltonian. If our Hamiltonian has a given energy E, then all of these ones in green are possible microstates of this system. And maybe at any given instant in time, it's in this one. Maybe this one or this one. But these are all the possible ones. Yes? Um, what's the word discretized? Uh, chop up. You know, uh, you know, like when you look at when you look at your TV screen, if you have a, if you have a 4K TV and maybe you use glasses. You can see the little pixels, right? So even though when you're standing far away, it looks continuous. But when you get really close, if you have good eyes, you can see little pixels, right? So in other words, the resolution, like if you have an old TV, an old TV might be 480, you know, you actually, they're analog, but you can't quite see it. But yeah, if you get you know, the, the, the 720p, the 1080p, uh, the, you know, the 4K, the 8K, if you go to the 720p, you can really see the pixels in it. That's a discretization of space, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're doing a discretization, not in 2D, 
in this case, 2D, but we're going to do it in base space, which is much higher dimensionality. All right, so this is how we're going to count microspace. Does this make sense to you guys? All right, yes? Why did you just choose like, that portion, I guess? Like, because this is momentum here, and this is position here. So these are all of the all the all the little little squares that are consistent with total energy have to be either plus or minus the square root of two me, right? So if I say I know the total energy of this particle, that's all I know, then you would say, okay, the only squares that the system can be in, the only microstates that can describe this system, is the ones that I have colored in green. Okay. So if delta P times delta Q has to be a constant, then can we just take any arbitrary delta P, delta Q, like, or is it like dependent on the system, or? You, you can expand delta P, but you have to shrink delta Q. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's arbitrary, but the volume has to be fixed to that, right? But for what we're doing here, we don't need to get into that complication. Yes? E is the total energy. Of the system. So I'm saying that I know, I know that I have a system where it's a single particle moving in one dimension, and I've only told you the total energy, and I and I ask you where could it be in phase space? So, so we get E on H, or is it? E is I'm giving you. That's information. Oh. I, that's information I've given you. Okay, I've given you a certain piece of information. From that information, you can conclude how many microstates are accessible to the system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. That's 2D. Baby steps. Let's go to 4D. Let's say we have the same particle moving in a two-dimensional box. Okay? Okay, your heads are going to explode if I keep going after this slide. Um, so if I have a thick particle moving in a two-dimensional box, well, okay, so it's pretty simple. I have now two momentum, and I have a potential energy that depends on two positions, and I have a potential energy surface that essentially goes to infinity at the edges of the box, the two-dimensional box, and it's zero inside, okay? So I can't draw a four-dimensional hyperspace on the screen, a 2D screen, let alone you know, draw it in the room somehow. Um, but if I took, if you imagine that space, and you took a cross section through a given Q1, Q2 slice, so you just looked at the, at the momentum, then what you would see is that this equation here describes a circle, right? That if I gave you, I told you the total energy, then you know, if I gave you the total energy, then if you were looking at a momentum cross-section, P1 and P2, you knew that it could only be in those microstates on that circle that satisfied that, right? And if position was coming out of the board, then it would be all possible positions. So this would be like a hyper-cylinder, right? Imagine a hyper the surface of a hyper-cylinder, right? So if you did a cross-section here, it would be a circle, but then going in and out of the board, and then in the other direction, Q1 and Q2, it's just going in all, it, all, all states are possible, so it's a, it's a hypercylinder, the surface of a hypercylinder. All right, so if I wanted to count microstates, I simply just do, I just go through every one of these microstates and I say, you know, does the Hamiltonian equal the energy? Which is, I'm telling you, here's the energy, count microstates. So you take your energy, you set it equal to the Hamiltonian. If that's the delta function, remember the delta function. If it's equal, I get one. If it's unequal, I get zero, right? So remember from the delta function, then I'm going to do that over every single hypervoxel here. And when I'm done, I'm going to have a number, OK? All right, wonderful. Now we come to the microcanonical ensemble. I want you to imagine that I don't have a particle moving in one, a single particle moving in one dimension, or a single particle moving in two dimensions. I want you to imagine I have 10 to the 23rd particles moving in three dimensions. All right? So 
There's a lot on this slide, but we'll go slow. Okay, so we have, I, tell you, I can tell you the total energy. That's the macroscopic property that I know. I know the total energy. I know it's in a volume V, but the Hamiltonian is going to take care of that because that's going to have a potential any surface that we're going to, it's going to model the walls that prevents it from going outside there. So I'm going to construct a six n dimensional phase space. Okay? There are six dimensions for every atom here, and then every atom adds to that space. Okay? I really am going slow on this, I think, right? So if I want to count the number of microstates, then I simply work my way through every single voxel, hypervoxel in that space, and I take the Hamiltonian and say, is it equal to the energy? Yes or no? If it is, I get a one. If it's not, no. And then I work my way through in this multiple summations along every dimension. I'm working my way through every single voxel, hypervoxel, and then I count the number of microstates. Okay. That's how Boltzmann counts microstates. Now, we also learned something Boltzmann didn't know because he didn't know about quantum mechanics is that we have to we have to take care of the fact that particles are indistinguishable in the gas phase. So if I have microstates where it's just particles changing position, they're actually count as the same microstate. So we have to still divide by 1 over n factorial if they're in the gas phase or not localized. On the other hand, if they were in a crystalline lattice where they weren't able to collide and move, you know, into, so there wasn't sort of uh, this uncertainty principle doesn't come into play, then this would just be 1. Okay? So if they're localized, like atoms in a crystalline lattice, this is 1. But if they're in a gas phase or a fluid phase, then that's going to be n factorial. Okay? This is what's called Boltzmann statistics. This still assumes that the, the number of microstates is much bigger than the number of particles. So any microstate is only occupied by none or one particle at the most. All right, that equation is discrete because our phase space is discrete. But if you decided to take your box, hypervoxel size and just make it smaller and smaller and smaller, then you could approximate that as an integral, but you still have to divide by this because you need a count, right? Otherwise, if you do this, if you do this, you're going to get something that's on has units of, uh, of position times momentum. But you have to divide by that, which has position times momentum to the 3n power. So this gives you the whole thing as a number, which is a count. So this is that that inter, that summation turned into integrals. Okay, that's what's called the classical limit approximation. But the true nature of phase space is discrete. So this is an approximation. Okay, the real equation is here. We're counting microstates. Well, I can see confused looks on your faces, some of your faces. That means you're listening. <laughs> That's good. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take in my picture of face space here, when I'm counting, I'm just going to replace all those by just one single sum. So I'm going to take every hypervoxel, and I'm just going to give it an index number. And I'm just going to sum from 1 equals you know, gamma, that's my index variable, from 1 to infinity, I'm just going to sum for every every voxel, I can say the Hamiltonian for this voxel, this voxel, this voxel, and I'm just going to check whether it's equal to my energy, and then I'm just going to sum up, and that's going to be my simple, simplified version of that hyperspace picture. Okay? Okay. Now, once we can count microstates, now we can, count thermo we can calculate thermodynamic properties. So if I have some property I'll call Y, then I know every microstate in my phase space, there is a particular value for that property. But my system can be in multiple possible microstates. So I'm going to do an average of Y for every one of the allowed microstates. So I'm going to say the, this P is the probability that I'm in a particular microstate. And y is the value of that property in the microstate. And I'm going to sum over all the microstates that are, that are consistent with the energy. And that's going to give me my average value. And I'm going to assume, we're going to assume, that 
the probability of being in any one of those microstates are all equal, just like we did in the very first example about the probability of it being in a particular uh, voxel of the, of, of the box, right, in the little v. So we're going to assume that the probability is equal to be at every one of those, in, any of those hypervoxels that's consistent with the total energy. And if it's not, then the probability is zero. Okay? All right. So the reality of the situation, and this is where it kind of uh, conceptually can get a little confusing as to whether this really is right or not, is that what you do know is that if I have a macroscopic system, at any given instant in time, yes, it is a point in phase space, and that point is evolving in time, and it's covering the surface, which is a constant energy surface, and really what you're seeing is you're doing a time average, right? You're, you're going into the lab and you're making a measurement. I'm measuring the heat capacity, I'm measuring the pressure or whatever, and you're measuring it over some time, and in thermodynamics we assume that everything is at equilibrium. And what do we mean by equilibrium? Well, you mean you've waited long enough that you know an isolated system is constant time, or you know a system when it's separated from its boundary space, constant time. So you're assuming that time somehow comes into this picture, but there's no time in thermodynamics other than the assumption that we waited long enough that we're in equilibrium. In the same statistical mechanics, we're going to assume that the time average is equal to this what we call ensemble average. Right. So this set of of hypervoxels in this phase space that are consistent with the energy. We call this a microcanonical ensemble. And from that microcanonical ensemble, we calculate all of the thermodynamic properties of the system. And we assume that those properties are identical to what we would have gotten if we had just been able to measure the instantaneous property as a function of time and then did the time. <laughs> this is something called the ergodic hypothesis, which Mathematically, is actually not correct. But the bottom line is, statistical mechanics, with this assumption, always gives the right answer. So there is something called the quasi-ergodic hypothesis, which says that you know it, it's almost true. For all practical purposes, it's true. So we're going to assume that that's true, that this average is equal to that average. OK, oh, I just went through it already, yeah. So, so this is, this is the assumptions in stat mech that that average is equal to that average. And he, uh, Boltzmann tried to prove this, but a lot of mathematicians jumped on him and said, no, 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 that's not true about phase space, that a particle can't cover the entire surface. So it's, you know, it's not likely that every single one of those voxels got uh, the particle moved through every single one of those voxels. So, uh, but it turns out in the end that you can approximate that as right and for all practical purposes, we're going to take that as true and make that a postulate of stat mm -hmm. Okay, so that was what's called the microcanonical ensemble. That was our way of counting microstates of an isolated system, right? I just all I knew was the total energy, the total volume mm -hmm. fixed, right, and the number of particles. That in thermodynamics we would call an isolated system. That was that was count, those, we counted those microstates using the microcanonical ensemble. But as you learn in thermodynamics, you know, isolated systems is not the best way to do your thermodynamics. If you're working on reactors, you want them to be you know, you know, at constant temperature or constant temperature and constant pressure. So the microcanonical ensemble is not enough for us to keep going. So we need to figure out how to get thermodynamic properties from stat, stat mech when we don't have, say, an isolated system. So this brings us to what's called the canonical ensemble. So what I want you to imagine here is we're going to build on what we learned before. I want you to imagine a system that has a given energy, a volume, a number of moles. So it's in a, a the system is in a rigid impermeable boundary, but it's a diathermal boundary or surrounding it. And so it's in contact with a reservoir, which has an energy, a volume, and number of moles, and a temperature too. So now we have two systems here. And we want to count microstates of both. And the, the collection of both systems 
is going to be an isolated system. So in other words, the microcanonical ensemble will, will be able to describe both systems, but it won't be able to describe the one in, the two inside. So we're going to use our understanding of the microcanonical ensemble to try to figure out what, how do we describe the ther statistical thermodynamics of this system in here in thermal contact with a reservoir. All right, so let's then start with what we know, which is that we know our super system is just the number of mo molecules or particles in the reservoir plus the system. The total volume is the, the reservoir in the system. And the total energy of everything is just the Hamiltonian for the reservoir, the Hamiltonian for the system, and the Hamiltonian describing the interaction between the reservoir and the system. For these guys to exchange energy, for them to come to thermal equilibrium, there has to be an interaction between the system and the reservoir. That's this potential energy of interaction term here. So we're going to assume that these two terms here are much, much bigger than this term. So it still exists, but it's much this potential energy between a particles in here to particles out here and vice versa. That's going to be much smaller than the other two terms. So we can approximate the total energy of the system <coughs> It's just simply the energy of this system, the, the reservoir plus the energy of the system. All right. Now, again, correctly, there should be a potential energy term for the interactions between them, but it's so small compared to these two that we can neglect it. But that's going to be an assumption we're going to use here. All right. So the total energy has to remain constant. So that means that if the system energy goes up, the reservoir energy has to go down. And likewise, if the reservoir energy goes up, the system energy has to go down, so they maintain a constant energy, right? So if we think about the microstates for the system, if the system has a fixed energy, then it's on one of these hypersurfaces, right, with a fixed energy. So on that hypersurface, if the system has a fixed energy, it can be in any possible microstate on a hypersurface. But if it exchanges energy with the reservoir, then it's going to move to another hypersurface, right? And the energy could go back and forth, so it could be in one, the, the system could be on one hypersurface, energy, constant energy hypersurface, then jump to another constant energy hypersurface, then jump to another one. It could jump back and forth between these different constant energy hypersurfaces. So imagine kind of a multi-dimensional onion, right? Every layer of the onion is a constant energy surface, and you're jumping back and forth between these different layers of the hyperdimensional onion, and each onion layer has a different constant energy. That's what the system is doing. Okay? So if they're in a particular layer, they all have equally probable uh, microstates, but if they jump to a lower energy uh, onion layer, then they're going to have a different equally probable uh, microstate. Okay, so that's how we're going to describe the system in this canonical ensemble as multiple constant energy layers that can all be populated. So this collection, all these constant energy ones with different possible constant energy ones as it exchanges energy with the reservoir, that collection of states is called the canonical ensemble. If the system was fixed and had only one energy, and only had one energy, and it was just one hypersurface, that's a microcanonical ensemble. But if it can exchange energy with the surroundings and jump to other constant energies, then all of those layers are the canonical ensemble. Yes? So we're assuming the <coughs> reservoir and the system both have the same temperature, so it's really just the We haven't assumed that yet. We're just assuming that they can exchange energy. All I'm saying is that if the system goes up in energy, the reservoir has to go down in energy. That's all we've assumed so far. But we're going to allow that to happen, right? And if the system goes up or down, then it's going to jump to a different onion layer, right? Hypersurface. That's all we've assumed so far. OK? I just, I just this is the earlier diagram of that T of the Oh, yeah, yeah, because I was jumping ahead of myself. I'm sorry. Yeah, I could I, to get rid of that for the moment. 
But later we're going to find that that's true. Yes. So we're assuming like there's a system and then it's surrounded by a reservoir that can supply it to the energy. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. We're, we're assuming that the system energy can go back and forth between the two. And when it goes into the system, energy goes in, it jumps to uh, a higher energy hypersurface. If it loses energy, it jumps to a lower energy hypersurface. Okay. You guys are asking good questions. All right. Now, if we know the system is in a particular energy, it has a particular energy E. Okay. But we don't know which microstate it is. We just know that it has an energy E. Then we know that the reservoir has to have an energy E T minus E. Right. So the the reservoir is on its hypersurface. The system is on its hypersurface, and the number of states that the system has on its hypersurface times the number of states that the reservoir has on its hypersurface is this. That's, that's the total, right? So if I then allow the energy to fluctuate back and forth, then the total number of allowed microstates for the system and surroundings has got to be the product as I sum over all possible energy fluctuations. Okay. So now I have a summation that runs over possible energies that the system is allowed between zero, basically zero to ET, right? If it goes to the total energy, then that means that all the energy is in the system and none is in the reservoir. Okay? If it's zero, then no energy is in the system and it's all in the reservoir and all, all in between. So we're going to do that summation. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say that the probability that the system has an energy E, the system is on a particular surface E, is just this product that up here divided by the total. Okay, so I've just calculated the probability that the system, even though it's fluctuated, the, the system, the probability that it's in a particular energy state, E, on a particular hypersurface. Yes? What type of energy is transferred between the system and the reservoir? Uh, it's, it's gonna have to be work, obviously, right? So in other words, a particle inside the system is going to interact with the particle outside the system, and then they're going to do work on each other, and energy is going to be transferred in that process. Okay. From, from a microscopic point of view, there's only work, right? Now that is going to be heat in thermodynamics, right? Because in this case, the volume is not allowed to expand, right? So it's going to, that, that mechanical work translates into thermodynamic heat as the interaction between them. Okay, good question. Any other questions? Okay, so I, I've actually now just count, made a probability. All right, that's pretty amazing, actually, I think. So if you, if you look at this probability, keep in mind that, you know, if you think about the surface area of a, of, a, of a sphere, as you expand the sphere, the surface area increases as the sphere increases in, in volume, right? So if I increase the energy, the number of microstates on the surface is getting bigger, right? If I'm in a hyper, if I'm in a hyperspace, if I'm in phase space, and I have 10 to the 23rd dimensions, a tiny increase in the, en in the energy is going to cause a massive increase in the number of microstates. Massive. That means that if the energy of the system goes up, it's the number of microstates goes up dramatically for the system, and it goes down dramatically for the surrounding, and vice versa. So that means that if you looked at the probability as a function of energy, it's going to be really sharply peaked at the, 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 uh, the mean energy of this case. So we can actually take this expression here, and we can take the derivative of this and set it equal to 0 to find out where that energy max is. And if I take the derivative of this, then it's going to give me, well, the, you know, use the, the product rule, it's going to give me this times that derivative plus that times that derivative. Let's go through this here. So that's what I have from the last slide. If I know that the energy of the reservoir is just total minus the system, and, and that means I have this differential here, that means I can rearrange this to this form where I move, this is equal to zero, so I'm going to move the reservoir terms over to this side, the system terms over to this side, and then using the rules for the derivatives of logs, I can change that to the, the partial of the log of the reservoir count uh, with respect to energy of the reservoir, with the partial of the log of the system count with respect to the system energy. And we recognize those guys, the logs, as the entropy. So we see that the entropy 
of the reservoir, the derivative of the entropy of the reservoir with respect to the energy of the reservoir is equal to the derivative of the system entropy with respect to the energy of the system. And those partial derivatives, we recognize as one over the temperature in thermodynamics. So we see that one over the temperature of the reservoir has to be equal to one over the temperature of the system when we're at this maximum. And that is why I wrote T is equal to T prime in that original slide. Which I probably should have left out now that you because it confused you. But this is the conclusion that we come to. Okay. It's the most probable situation. It's not that this is always true. That's the most probable. It's so probable that there's no other chance that you would find anything else. All right. So now we've learned how to count in the canonical ensemble and get the probabilities. Let's ask a different question. What if I knew that my system had not only had a given energy, so it was on a, you know, on, a, on a given surface, but I knew the exact microstate that the system was in. If I knew the exact microstate the system in, then the count for the system is one, right? That's, that's the number of microstates. So I know it. If I know it, then it's one. That means that the reservoir would be all those microstates consistent with knowing that one microstate for the, the system. So that means that if I know the energy of, I'll call it the gamma uh, microstate of the system, the number of microstates of the reservoir divided by the total number of microstates of reservoir plus system is going to be this probability. This probability I'm calling P gamma because I, I to be very clear that this is the probability of being, of the system being in one microstate. And previously, we make sure this is really clear. I gave you the probability of the system just being on one constant energy surface. Okay? Two distinctly different probabilities. The probability that the system is on one constant energy surface, which includes all of those microstates on that surface. And now, the probability that the system is in one particular microstate on the surface. Okay? So, what I can do next, then, is I can take that expression here, and I'm going to take the log, I'm going to take that expression here, which I'm going to write down in terms of this is the energy of the reservoir, which is ET minus the energy of the system, so I'm going to just call that E prime. And I'm going to write down the log of both sides, so that gives me, because this is divided, that's going to be the log of the reservoir and, uh, states minus the log of the total states. And then I'm going to use the fact that the log of the number of states is just the entropy. So that means that the log of the probability is 1 over kb times the differences of the entropies. And then I'm going to do, for the reservoir, I'm going to do a Taylor series expansion about the energy of the reservoir, which is the total energy minus the energy of the system, the thermodynamic energy. So I'm going to make this Taylor series expansion, and I'm going to be able to neglect the higher order terms and this is going to allow me to substitute back in to this expression here. And if I substitute back into that expression, and this gets a little tricky here, then what's going to happen is that uh, I can replace this term with the temperature. And this guy then becomes the energy of the reservoir, which is just ET minus the system, plus u minus e gamma for the system divided by t. And then I can then use the extensive property. I don't want to go through this derivation too down. I want you to go back through this later. But then when you, through this derivation, what you find is that the log of this probability is equal to the energy of the system minus t s divided by kvt minus the energy of the microstate divided by kvt. We recognize this as the free energy of the system so it becomes this here, okay? okay so that's, that's a lot in that slide. Go back and, and follow that, make sure you follow this derivation. But this log of this probability is equal to everything that's related to the system. And we started out having the log of the probability involving the reservoir properties. So what I was able to do is to go from a probability that depended upon the reservoir to a probability that depended upon only the system. Okay? Which is, we did something similar actually in our thermodynamic potentials. 
So now that I have that expression here, I can exponentiate both sides and I get this expression where I just take this and I convert it into this and I see that the probability of it being in a single microstate, gamma, is just e, the exponential of e to the minus e gamma over kBT divided by the exponential of the negative Helmholtz energy divided by kT. So that probability has to add up to one. So if I normalize this, it means that this all has to be equal to one, which requires that this exponential is equal to this summation over here, which we call this summation the canonical ensemble partition function. And we see in this derivation that the Helmholtz energy was equal to the negative kT of the log of that, this function here. All right. So what I've got done now is we've gone from just calculating simple things like entropy, like we did in the first part of the lecture, to now we're able to calculate energy expressions from, from this. And this quantity, this summation over all the states, which is called the partition function, actually turns out to be the key core function. From that function, all thermodynamic properties can be derived. And that's what we'll use going forward. So the probability then is, go back here, you can see that the probability is just divided by that, but that is just, yeah, this Q is just this guy right here, sorry, that right here. So I can go back here, I can divide it by Q, and I can say that this is the probability of being in a given microstate uh, of the system. This you might recognize as the Boltzmann distribution. Maybe you've seen this equation before for calculating the probability that a system is in a given energy state uh, divided by this sum down here. So this is our probability function, and this is written in terms of a sum over every individual microstate um, of the system. But I also know that if I'm on one of these surfaces, and constant energy surfaces, that the total number of microstates is just this. Uh, is the microcanonical count. So I can actually change this probability, which is the probability as a function of gamma, to the probability of being in one microstate, to the probability of being having just one energy. And that would be given by that expression here. And I can even rewrite the, the canonical ensemble in terms of the microcanonical ensemble like this. And then in the classical limit, I can even approximate it as a integral, the, the summation is an integral like this, where this is termed what's called the density of states. And maybe you've heard that term tossed around in seminars when people learn about the density of states, and that's what we're doing here, okay? Okay, you, you've come a long way. Hour and a half lecture. I wish this was three times a week, but it's twice. Uh, so we'll keep going. <clears throat> so uh, the internal energy is a pretty simple calculation at this point because you can see it's just the energy for each state times the probability of that state. So you just sum those up and now you can just plug that in to that probability expression here, uh, sorry, here, up here, and you get this expression here. And you can do a little manipulation here and you can see that if I took the derivative of the partition function with respect to 1 over temperature, it actually gives me this. And then I can rearrange this expression so that, uh, that the, into here, put this into here, and I can get this expression here, where I can then get dq over q and one over partial with respect to one over t, I can turn it into this. And then from this identity here, I can convert this into this. So again, I'm going fast through this, but I expect you to just go through and follow that derivation to see that we get a multi-purpose boxed equation here for how to get the energy from the canonical ensemble partition function. So this partition function has everything. Everything you want to know about the system is in there. And it's just a summation over the states. Okay. All right. So now we're done with sort of the first part of this chapter where we're looking at the sort of most generic viewpoint where we're not thinking about individual atoms or molecules. This, you can use this whether you're talking about uh, 
you know, molecules, or whether you're talking about you know uh, stars and astronomy. People use you know statistical mechanics in all types of contexts, not just thermodynamics, actually. And what we did was the most general way of looking at this. But now we want to dive deeper into the actual atoms and molecules and what we know about their motions. So we know that if we have molecules, say they all have x, all the molecules have x atoms in them, then we could write down the Hamiltonian that there is all of those uh, interactions that we learned about for individual molecules. So molecules translate, molecules rotate, molecules vibrate, right? Those are what interactions we know, Hamiltonians we know that will describe that kind of motion. In addition, we know that molecules are attracted to other molecules, so there could be electrostatic attractions, whether it's charge, 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 dipole, 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 induced dipole, charge, right? We learned all those interactions, but that's another part of the story here. In an ideal gas, we don't have any interactions, right? It's all this up here. But in a real gas, we have to worry about those interactions between the molecules. But in this sort of very you know, baby step picture of doing stat mech, we're just going to ignore those interactions now and just look at non-interacting molecules. So the ideal gas approximation here. So this is what we're going to approximate our Hamiltonian to, to, and then in another class you can worry about this term. So if your Hamiltonian then is just a sum of all these contributions, if you plug that into the canonical ensemble equation, then it turns out that for every one of those, those uh, molecules uh, that's in this contribution here, uh, that you can write this as a product from molecule 1 to molecule n of this summation here. This means that we can write what's called a molecular canonical partition function. So we can just pretend like the individual molecule has its own separate phase space associated with it as part of a larger collection of molecules. So this is what's called a molecular canonical ensemble. And we will also include in this, this factor here for, for sort of accounting for indistinguishable microstates. So this was one over n factorial, which is a gas. But when we're talking about individual molecules, we also need to account for the fact that some molecules, as you rotate them, become indistinguishable from the original orientation. So if I had uh, hydrogen and I flipped it 180 degrees, I can't tell that I flipped hydrogen 180 degrees. So that should not be counted as two microstates when you flip it 180 degrees. So if it's HCl, well then this would be one. But if it's, it's hydrogen, it's two. If it's water, it's two. If it's, uh, actually, if it's, you know, Benzene, it's 12, right? So you can see that there are all these indistinguishable uh, orientations that we need to take account for in our classical picture here in Calvin. Right. So if this is all then uh, you know, good, where you can make this approximation, then you can then say that all those Hamiltonians are identical, and we can make all the Q, Q1, Q2, Q3, are all going to be identical to each other. We can write down that the the canonical ensemble partition function is just the microcanonical ensemble uh, partition function to, to the nth power divided by this uh, factor for correcting for indistinguishability. Yeah. And this is the what we'll use then for calculating the statistical uh, thermodynamic properties of gases and, and uh, solids and so on. Okay. Now, as I said before. Uh, we can think about splitting our space into two spaces now. If we do this non-interacting particles picture, we can think about the phase space of the molecule. So a molecule, if it's just an atom, it just has you know, x1, x, y, z, p, x, p, y, p, z. But if it had, if it was a diatomic molecule, then you'd have to worry about you know, the translation coordinates, the rotation coordinates, and the vibration coordinates. And that would make up one small phase space called mu space. And then taken together with all n molecules, you can construct what's called the, the gamma space, which is the full phase space that we've been talking about so far in the class. Okay. So in the, the micro space, the, the, the mu space, 
the molecular partition function is just the sum over those microstates like this. So there's a complete analogy of everything we just did now for molecule, individual molecules that we did for, for the whole system. And if we were doing the, using the uh, sum over discrete energy levels and discrete states, we would do this equation here, where this G would be kind of like the microcanonical ensemble for the molecular microcanonical ensemble. And that is good, what is also known as the degeneracy when we get to quantum mechanics. And if we wanted to approximate this as an integral, we could do that here, and that would give us what we call uh, the molecular density of states there. So the whole story that we just learned then gets translated to a smaller space for the individual molecule when the molecules are not interacting. And it's exactly the same arguments. Okay. <clears throat> so if we take a look at what we have in that new space, then we have translation, rotation, vibration. We could even have electronic motion, nuclear motion, which we're not, we haven't got to because we haven't got the quantum yet. But you can continue to add all of those terms and because there's no interactions between, that's our assumption, no interactions, then when you calculate the partition function, it actually separates into a product of individual ones. And so we're just completely continuing to divide this problem up into smaller and smaller problems. And so now we can see that we can take the motion of mu space, we've taken gamma space and cut it down to mu space, and now we're going to take mu space and we're going to cut it down to just what's happening with translations, what's happening with irritations, and what's happening with vibrations. Again, this is only because we're ignoring the interactions between the molecules. But that's a good approximation, because that's the ideal gas approximation, and that works for a lot of situations where that, that's very practical. So that means that this is our molecular canonical ensemble. This is just a, a product, and that means that the canonical partition function just becomes this product raised to the end power, which then looks like this. So that leaves us with then the last bit here, which is that if we know the form of these Hamiltonians, translation, rotation, vibration, there's this thing called the equipartition of energy theorem that says that for every coordinate that shows up in the Hamiltonian squared, Stat next says you get one half kVT in your thermal energy for every coordinate that shows up squared. It seems kind of weird, but actually you can prove that now using this statistical mechanics picture. So if you take the classical picture and you plug in those Hamiltonians, we'll just take, say we have a Hamiltonian that has this kind of generic sum, or we have a coordinate squared, and we plug it into this expression up here, then I'll let you do the math, but you can see that all of the, the position coordinates, the, the parts that aren't related to y, will integrate out, and you'll be left with just the summation of the, pro the product sorry, of all the y terms. And that will then, with an integral, simplify to this. And then you can plug that into the canonical partition function, which looks like this. Get this expression here. Then you can make it the, the pool the log of that guy to take these guys and separate it out. When you calculate the energy, you only pull out this term here, and you get this where m, as you can remember, was just the number of squared coordinates that we had in our Hamiltonian. And you can see that the energy is just m over 2. For every squared coordinate that showed up, we get m over 2 in the average energy gets added. And that actually works really well for translational motion. Uh, and once you have the energy, you can calculate the, the heat capacity, because you can just turn this into a molar energy like this. Then you get the heat capacity, and your heat capacity is just m over two, 2 times r, where m is the number of coordinates that were squared in your molecule, uh, individual molecule Hamiltonian. So if I look at translational motion, I have three coordinates squared. If I, from that, I just predict 3r over 2. That's 12.47. If I measure the heat capacity of these monatomic gases, I get 12.47. Perfect agreement for the heat capacity of those gases. If I take a diatomic molecule, well, I have three coordinate terms for translation. For rotation, I have two coordinate terms because one of the moments of inertia is zero. 
and that gives me one normal load. So I'm going to have seven quartic terms, should be 7R over 2, that's 29.10. I'm short every single time in the experimental measurement. So the experimental measurement is off by about one gas constant. So that's weird. And this bugged Maxwell Boltzmann a lot, uh, and Buck Boltzmann particularly. Uh, and what was happening was they were, did not know that energy was quantized. They didn't know about quantum mechanics. And so they didn't realize that energy is not going to partition equally into all of these different types of motions. What they saw was, you know, if I threw away the vibrational contribution, I actually got pretty good agreement for these diatomics. But why would the vibration not get the energy that the other guys were getting? And that was the puzzle. Boltzmann was way ahead of his time, but he was before quantum. And he didn't know about energy being discretized. So he didn't know that the total energy was not enough thermal energy to actually even excite the quantized vibrational energy levels. Why do these guys quantize? That's what we're going to be doing next. But the fact that they're quantized means that they got the right answer for translation. In a room temperature, they got the right answer for rotation. But at a room temperature, they couldn't get the right answer for vibration. And it turns out you can evaluate how high you need to be in temperature by just looking at the difference in the quantization of energy divided by KB. You get a temperature. If you're above that temperature, Boltzmann's classical picture works. If you're below that temperature, you need a quantum story. And you can see translation requires you to be above 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. Rotation requires you to be above 10 Kelvin. But vibration requires you to be above 1,000 Kelvin. That's why it didn't work. So if you get to high enough temperatures, you get all of them. This is the heat capacity of hydrogen as a function of temperature. And you can see that at low temperatures, you don't even get, you only get translation. Then rotation kicks in about 100 Kelvin. And then vibration kicks in around 1,000 Kelvin there in the total heat capacity. OK. All right, I got just a couple minutes, so I'll just give you one last thing. And that is that when you have a crystalline solid, you can think about every atom in the solid is vibrating back and forth in three directions. So there's three vibrational terms. Each one is, uh, has two chordic terms, right? There's no translation, there's no rotation in the solid. So we expect for a solid to be 3R for the heat capacity, which is 25 uh, joules per mole Kelvin. And in fact, all solids, when you get the high temperatures, are reach this level of 3R. So this is what's called the Dulong and Petit rule. And in fact, actually, if you look at heat capacities for solids, pretty much all of them are really close to that value at room temperature. So, and it's a very simple argument. So even though you need quantum to get the, exactly the right answer, the machinery is all here and it gives you the right answer in a number of places. Okay. And that's the last slide.